In this video, we're going to look at the first part of the Chapter 8 notes. Chapter 8 is titled Statistical Inference, Confidence Intervals. Recall from previous chapters that researchers are often interested in learning about a population. Unfortunately, collecting data from every element in the population can be difficult. Instead, researchers will take a subgroup from the sample point from the population, known as the sample, to examine. And so we have these very important definitions that we've seen several times now. So take a moment um, and make sure to review these definitions. In this chapter, we're going to continue to develop a set of tools that will allow us to take the information contained in the sample to say something reasonable about what is occurring in the population. Previously, in Chapter 7, we studied the behavior of the statistic to see what the behavior of the statistic suggests about the parameter. We saw that if we create a sampling distribution, that the statistics follow a bell-shaped pattern if the sample size is large enough. We will review the sampling distribution. What does the sampling distribution tell us about the behavior of statistics? First, let's review what a sampling distribution is. A sampling distribution is the distribution of sample statistics computed for different random samples of the same size from the same population. A sampling distribution helps us visualize how the sample statistic varies from sample to sample. There are four properties you must know about the sampling distribution. If each of the data points used to create the, the plot is a statistic, calculate it from a random sample of the same size taken from the same population. At the center, or mean, of the distribution is the value of the parameter. This is the same as saying that if we calculate the mean of all the statistics, it will equal the parameter. The plot has a symmetric bell shape under certain conditions, and the standard deviation of the distribution is equal to the standard error. How do we know that the sampling distribution will be bell-shaped? In Chapter 7, you create sampling distributions for a single proportion and a single mean. We saw in both cases that the sampling distribution was approximately bell-shaped with mean equal to the parameter. There is a fundamental theorem in statistics that informs us that this will always happen under certain conditions. Recall that we will be working with the following statistic parameter sets. In this chapter, we're going to be primarily focused on a single mean and a single proportion. The central limit theorem can be applied to describe the behavior of each of the above statistics when repeated sampling is performed. Flow is the central limit theorem for the single proportion and the single mean. Notice for each scenario, we are describing the properties of the sampling distribution listed on page 1 of the notes. The central limit theorem for a single proportion. When choosing random samples of size n from a population with proportion p, the distribution of the sample proportion has the following characteristics. The center will be the mean, which is equal to the population proportion p. Spread. The standard error can be calculated using the formula p times 1 minus p divided by n and the square root of that quantity. Shape. If the sample size is sufficiently large, the distribution is reasonably normal. The larger the sample size, the more the sampling distribution tends to a normal distribution. A normal distribution is a good approximation as long as n times p is larger than or equal to 15 and n times 1 minus p is larger greater than or equal to 15, which is the same as having an expected count of at least 15 in each category. One thing to note here is if you had a statistics course previously, your previous course may have used a different cutoff than 15. Different textbooks will use different values here, ranging from about 5 to 15. Your book is conservative and uses 15. Next, we'll look at the central limit theorem for a single mean. When choosing random samples of size n from a population with mean mu, the distribution of the sample means has the following characteristics. Center. The mean is equal to the population mean mu. Spread. The standard error can be calculated using sigma divided by the square root of n. Shape. If the sample size is sufficiently large, the distribution is reasonably normal. The larger the sample size, the more the sampling distribution tends to a normal distribution. 
A normal distribution is a good approximation as long as n is greater than or equal to 30. If the population data is normally distributed, the sampling distribution will be normal for smaller sample sizes. One of the most important parts of the central limit theorem is the sample size requirements. To predict the behavior of statistics, we need the sample size to be reasonably large. Many people think that a sample needs to contain hundreds or thousands of people before we can make valid inference. Notice that the required sample sizes for both the proportion and the single mean are much smaller than that. Section 8.1, point and interval estimates of population parameters. There are two main types of inference that we're going to learn this semester, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. The topic of chapter 8 is confidence intervals. We will see hypothesis testing in chapter 9. How can we use the sampling distribution to find an interval of reasonable values for the parameter? Our goal is to learn how to translate the information contained in a single sample to learn about the parameter. The most simplistic way to do this is to use a point estimate. Definition. A point estimate is a single value estimate of the parameter we are interested in learning about, and it's our best guess. The statistic from a sample can be used as a point estimate. Once we have collected data, we use the appropriate sample statistic as a point estimate. This gives us that x bar is a point estimate for mu, and p hat is a point estimate for p. We know that due to sampling error, that the statistic or point estimate is rarely exactly equal to the parameter. Instead of using the point estimate, which is a single number, we can use an interval estimate. An interval estimate gives an interval of plausible values for a population parameter. In other words, it is an interval of numbers that is believed to cover the actual value of the parameter. Here is an illustration from your book. Notice on the top part of the diagram, we have just a point estimate, which is a single number. An interval estimate, on the other hand, creates an interval around the point estimate. By itself, a point estimate is insufficient because it does not tell us how close the estimate is likely to be to the parameter. An interval estimate is much more useful. In the illustration above, it tells us that the point estimate of 0.73 falls within a margin of error of 0.02 of the actual estimate. Using the margin of error, the interval estimate helps us gauge the accuracy of the point estimate. A good estimator of a parameter has two desirable properties. Property 1. A good estimator has a sampling distribution that is centered at the parameter it tries to estimate. We define center here to be the mean of that sampling distribution. An estimator with this property is said to be unbiased. Remember from chapter 7, we know that under certain random sampling, or we know that under random sampling, the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample mean x bar is equal to the population mean mu. Hence, the sample mean x bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. Similarly, we know that under random sampling, the sampling distribution of the sample proportion equals the population proportion. And so the sample proportion is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion. Property 2. A good estimator has a small standard deviation compared to other estimators. This tells us that the estimator tends to fall closer to the parameter than other estimates. For example, for estimating the center mu of a normal distribution, both the sample mean and sample median are unbiased, but the sample mean has a smaller standard deviation and is therefore a better estimator for mu. Interval estimation. Constructing an interval that contains the parameter, hopefully. An interval estimate indicates precision by giving an interval of numbers around a point estimate. The interval consists of numbers that are most believable values for the unknown parameter based on the observed data. An interval estimate is designed to contain the parameter with some chosen probability. Since the interval estimates contain the parameter with a certain degree of confidence, they are referenced as confidence intervals. This confidence is usually expressed as a percentage. If the interval was constructed using a confidence level of 0.05, we say that we have 95% confidence that the interval contains the parameter, and we have what is called a 95% confidence interval. 
How do we construct the confidence interval? We use the sampling distribution of the point estimate. This distribution tells us the probability that the point estimate will fall within any certain distance of the parameter. We can use the sampling distribution to help us motivate how to construct the interval estimate. Consider the following example. Suppose I have a sp spinner that is split evenly into two colors, blue and pink, and I want to know out of an infinite number of spins what percentage of the time I would land on blue. I take samples of size 20. I do this by repeatedly spinning the spinner 20 times and calculate the percentage of times I land on blue out of the 20 spins for each sample. Know that this is a special case where I know the value of the parameter. Since the spinner is fair, I know the parameter P is equal to 0.5. Here we have a simulated sampling distribution for this example where 100 samples were selected. So notice here each of the 100 dots in this plot represents the proportion of times the spinner landed on blue when it was spun 20 times. So we see that we have some of the time we landed on the blue spinner 50% of the time, and in others we would only land 30 or 25%, all the way up to 70 to 75%. Our goal is to construct an interval that is likely to cover the parameter. First, notice since we are working with proportions, we could propose the interval from 0 to 1. This interval will always contain the parameter when working with a single proportion, since proportions are restricted to the interval between 0 and 1. The problem with this interval is that it's not very informative. Let's look at the sampling distribution to see if we can construct a better interval. Recall that each dot in the plot represents a statistic, specifically a p-hat. We will start by drawing a vertical line where the parameter is located. Keep in mind that usually the parameter is unknown. Next, notice that 98% of the statistics fall between 0.3 and 0.7. We can see this because there are 100 dots total, and we have two of the dots that fall outside of the box. The farthest any of the statistics in the blue box are away from the parameter is 0.2. For any of the statistics in the blue box, we could create an interval centered at the statistic with the length 0.2 on either side, and the interval will cover the parameter. On the bottom of page 6 of your notes, you have what this interval would look like visually. Looking at the sampling distribution, we see the green line represents an interval like the one described above. Notice here the interval is centered directly on the parameter and it has length 0.2 extending outwards. We can move this interval around to different statistics inside of the box and see if the green interval still covers the orange parameter. Notice here we've moved we've shifted the interval to be centered on statistics which are valued at 0.45. Notice that this interval does cover the orange line representing the parameter. Here, we've shifted the interval to be centered on statistics equal to 0 0.50. Again, the interval still covers the orange line representing the parameter. We could even go down as far as 0.3 and center the interval on statistics equal to 0.3, and again, the green interval will still cover the parameter. This tells us if the green interval is centered anywhere inside of the blue box, the interval will cross, cross the parameter. But what if the green interval is centered outside of the box? Notice here, if the center of the green interval moves outside of the blue box, the interval will no longer cover the parameter. This tells us that if we use the interval, and again, we move it here and it didn't cover, that if we use the, statistic, the interval equal to the statistic plus or minus 0.2, 98% of the resulting intervals based on the statistics in the plot will cover the parameter. In other words, we have a 98% confidence interval. Notice that for all the statistics in the blue box, we get more a more informative interval than the interval from 0 to 1. The cost of the more informative interval is that for some values of the statistical
the resulting interval will not cover the parameter. How can we find an interval of reasonable values for the parameter if we only take a single sample? Notice that creating a sampling distribution required us to take many samples from the population. In the real world, we only get to select one sample from the population to help us estimate the parameter. One common form for an interval estimate is known as a confidence interval. A confidence interval is constructed by taking the statistic plus or minus the margin of error, where the margin of error reflects the precision of the sample statistic as a point estimate for the parameter. The margin of error is constructed by taking into account the standard error and the percentage of intervals that would cover the parameter based on the behavior of the sampling distribution. Suppose we want to construct a 95% confidence interval for a population proportion. Recall from Chapter 6 that approximately 95% of a normal distribution falls within two standard deviations from the mean. This was known as the empirical rule. We can make this more precise now and find the interval given by the mean plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations includes exactly 95% of the normal distribution. Since the sampling distribution of the sample proportion is approximately normal, the probability is 0.95 the sample proportion falls within about 1.96 standard deviations of the population proportion. The distance of 1.96 standard deviations is called the margin of error in this case. Once the sample is selected, if the sample proportion does fall within 1.96 standard deviations of the population proportion, which happens about 95% of the time, then the interval from the sample proportion minus 1.96 times the standard deviation to the sample proportion plus 1.96 times the standard deviation contains the population proportion. Or another way to say this is that with probability about 0.95, a sample proportion value occurs such that the interval sample proportion plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation contains the unknown population proportion. This interval of numbers is a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion. Definitions. A confidence interval for a parameter is an interval computed from sample data by a method that will capture the parameter for a specified proportion of all samples. The success rate or the proportion of all samples whose interval contain the parameter is known as the confidence level. A P% percent confidence interval will contain the true parameter for P% percent of all samples, where P% percent could be any percentage from 0 to 100. In a picture, the black vertical line represents the parameter. The parameter is a fixed number. Each dot or circle represents a statistic from a random sample. The statistics are random since they depend on the random samples. Each horizontal line represents a confidence interval centered at the statistic. The interval is random since the interval depends on the statistic which depends on a random sample. If the intervals are 95% confidence intervals, then 95% of the confidence intervals will cover the parameter. Notice that there are 95 green intervals which cover the parameter and 5 red ones that do not. This plot represents a list of confidence intervals. Some of the intervals cross the parameter and some do not. Let's look at an example. A 2018, a random sample of n is equal to 155 EKU students found that the average number of text messages sent or received per student per day is 41.5 messages with a margin of error for a 95% confidence interval of 12.2. Confirm that the sample size requirement for the central limit theorem is met and give a 95% confidence interval for the average number of text messages sent or received per day for EKU students. First of all, notice here that we had a random sample of 155 EKU students. So we both have the random sample which we need, and also our 155 is larger than our sample size requirement of 30 for the central limit theorem, so both of those requirements are met. Now to construct the interval, what we'll do is we'll take 41.4 plus or minus the 12.2. This is the statistic plus or minus the margin of error. 
41.4 minus 12.2 gives the 29.2. And 41.4 plus 12.2 gives the 53.6. What this tells us is that any value between 29.2 and 53.6 is a reasonable value for the parameter, where the parameter here is the average number of text messages sent or received per student per day for all EKU students. Confidence intervals are important because they give us a range of reasonable values for the parameter. Now it's your turn. See if you can answer the next three questions. Pause the video and when you come back, we'll talk about the answers together. The problem states, suppose that a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion is 0.7 to 0.9. The first question asked was, what statistic was observed in the, I mean, was observed in the sample? Well, recall that the statistic is always at the very center of the interval. The value at the center of this interval is 0.8. So our statistic in this case is p hat, which is equal to 0.8. Is 0.85 a reasonable value for the parameter? Notice that 0.85 is inside of the interval from 0.7 to 0.9, so it is a reasonable value. On the other hand, 0.2 is not inside the interval, so it is not a reasonable value. How do we interpret a confidence interval and what does it mean to be confident? Confidence intervals have a very specific interpretation. The interpretation of a confidence interval must include three things, the level of confidence, a reference to the parameter of interest, and the calculated interval. These three things are very important, and all interpretations of confidence intervals must include these three things. Let's look at an example together. In 2018, a random sample of n equals 155 EKU students found that the average number of text messages sent or received per student per day is 41.4 messages. The resulting confidence interval is the following. We're going to interpret this interval. Here's the interpretation. We are 95% confident that the average number of text messages sent or received by EKU students per student per day is between 29.2 and 53.6 text. Let's break down the interpretation. First, we have the level of confidence. Next, we reference our parameter of interest. And last, we give the calculated interval. There are many common misinterpretations of confidence intervals. We'll look at each. The first misinterpretation says a 95% confidence interval contains 95% of the data in the population. This is incorrect because the interpretation needs to refer to the location of the parameter, not the data. Misinterpretation two. I'm 95% sure that the mean of a sample will fall within a 95% confidence interval for the mean. This interpretation needs to refer to the location of the parameter, not the statistic. We know that the statistic is always at the center of the confidence interval. Misinterpretation 3. The probability that the population parameter is in this particular 95% confidence interval is 0.95. The parameter is a single fixed number. This is saying that the parameter is random, which would be incorrect. In the next videos, we'll look at several examples of how to calculate confidence intervals. This concludes the first video for the Chapter 8 notes.